I'm just calling yeah. him. Please go ahead. Please. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this uh, very important dialogue. Actually, uh, uh, Director Dr. Gupta had an engagement, but he cancelled it because he felt that this meeting is much more important than the one he was going to, because the relationship between the two countries, according to him and according to all of us has got its place at the top of our agenda. So uh, I would request uh, the, Dr. Gupta to take over the proceedings and uh, initiate the dialogue. Dr. Gupta. Namaskar and good morning to everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome guests from uh, Nepal and uh, distinguished participants from India for uh, this uh, India-Nepal relations dialogue. I entirely agree uh, with uh, General Sani that uh, uh, our relationship with Nepal is perhaps the most important relationship we have because it's a unique relationship. It has a very rich historical commonality, cultural uh, uh, commonalities. And although Presently, there is some kind of a chill in the relationship, but uh, I think uh, the things are moving in the right direction. And we heard that uh, the Indian Foreign Secretary is likely to visit uh, Nepal shortly. Uh, we recently had uh, General Narwani uh, visiting uh, Nepal uh, for the uh, customary uh, honorary a generalship of the Nepal Army. And uh, I think this uh, channel and this link between the two armies is extremely important uh, for uh, our uh, bilateral relationship. So it's good that uh, the uh, visits have started and uh, hopefully there will be more visits uh, uh, in the near future. And I also see from the Nepalese press that uh, the Nepalese foreign minister may also uh, visit. So I think this uh, silsila of uh, visits and contacts uh, needs to continue no matter what the state of relationship is. And uh, that is why we thought that uh, we should hold uh, this uh, dialogue amongst uh, experts who know the relationship uh, very well and who have been dealing with uh, this uh, bilateral ties for many years and uh, who know each other also very well. And they're all well wishes of uh, Indian and Nepalese people and uh, India-Nepal relationship. So I want to thank uh, uh, Sunil Kesi for, uh, and uh, Shiradha Datta from uh, the VIF uh, for uh, organizing this uh, roundtable uh, where we can uh, uh, freely discuss uh, uh, India-Nepal relations. The purpose of uh, uh, this uh, roundtable is uh, uh, really to look for uh, uh, positive ideas uh, which could uh, deepen our uh, relationship further. Uh, each country has its uh, own compulsions uh, and uh, there are many factors which uh, shape uh, the foreign policy of uh, each country. But I think uh, India and Nepal, as I said, has a unique uh, relationship. And uh, good relationship is uh, uh, extremely uh, necessary that we maintain good relations at all times. And this particular dialogue, I'm sure, uh, will uh, uh, dwell upon the uh, relationship and how to take it uh, forward and some positive, constructive and doable ideas uh, will come forth. So I want to uh, welcome our uh, uh, speakers today, General Katwal, the former Chief of uh, Army Staff Nepal, uh, Shri Uday Rana, former State Finance Minister, uh, Dr. Deepak Prakash Bhatta, MP Nepalese uh, <coughs> Communist Party, the Prashottam Ujha, former uh, Commerce Secretary. 
<coughs> from our side, we have uh, Ambassador Ranjit Ray, who is known uh, very well to both sides. Former uh, Ambassador to Nepal. We have uh, Shri Sanjay Chadda. I think he should have joined by now. He is our uh, additional secretary in the uh, Ministry of Commerce. Then we have uh, uh, Lieutenant General retired uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rakesh Sharma, uh, former uh, Adjutant uh, General, and uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Nihar Naik, who is a research fellow at the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. In addition, we have uh, a very distinguished uh, participants. Uh, General Ravi Sani just spoke. Shri Aradatta, who is uh, uh, ending our, uh, our neighborhood program in the BIF. Ambassador Satish Chandra. Uh, we also have uh, our colleagues from the BIF. And I noticed that there are other people also from the Nepali side. So I think we have a very good uh, uh, program lined up for us. And uh, if you permit, then I'll uh, uh, now uh, first start according to the uh, uh, program. Uh, let me uh, request uh, uh, Sunil Casey, if he wishes to uh, just uh, start off the uh, program. And then uh, after that, uh, Ambassador Rajit Ray. Uh, for the speakers, uh, since the uh, time is short, we would request that uh, the remarks may be made in uh, 10 minutes. And uh, I request everyone to adhere to the 10 minutes limit so that we can have some time uh, later on for some question and answers and discussion. So may I request uh, Sunil Casey to uh, say a few words. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, it's a particular pleasure and delight uh, to host the second Nepal-India bilateral dialogue with Vivekananda International Foundation before the visit of the upcoming Foreign Secretary on 26th of November to hold the bilateral dialogue with uh, Nepal. I think uh, uh, in our first dialogue uh, at the time, uh, the visit uh, from Indian side was not happened. And after that, uh, the Indian chief of the army staff visited Nepal. Then another uh, senior government official visited Nepal. Then we are having a very uh, pos we are you know actually moving in a very positive direction uh, to ha to uh, strengthen our uh, relationship in a very deeper cooperation. And in this, uh, you know, very important uh, time, we are holding this dialogue and I'm very much uh, uh, glad, you know, to have the distinguished uh, friends from India and Nepal to speak in today's uh, program. So uh, I once again welcome everyone on behalf of the co-organizer AIDIA and uh, FIIA. Uh, and I hope that today's uh, discussion would bring some fruitful, uh, uh, you know, inputs and later we'll be developing those inputs in a policy recommendation documents, which can be given to the government of Nepal and the Embassy of India and Kathmandu. That is what we do in our regular uh, webinar series. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Sunilji, for those uh, opening remarks. And now I request uh, Ambassador Sanjit Ray, Ranjit Ray, to kindly uh, set the scene for us uh, during this discussion. Ten minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Arvind, and uh, congratulations to VIF uh, and AIDIA for organizing this uh, roundtable. I think uh, this comes at a very uh, appropriate time uh, in our bilateral relationship, uh, which is, uh, you know, heading northwards. It's looking very positive. Uh, and, uh, you know, namaste to all the distinguished participants, and especially my very dear friends uh, from Nepal. I thought I would briefly talk about uh, four sets of issues. The first is the current domestic political situation in Nepal. The second is the process of rapprochement that has begun with India. And third, I thought a little bit about China. And, you know, finally, there is this big issue where the U.S. is involved in Nepal. And this is that Millennium Challenge Cooperation, Cooperation Project. So I thought, you know, briefly, I'll talk about these four issues. Now, the current uh, political, domestic political situation uh, is, seems to be heating up again in Nepal, especially within the uh, Nepalese Communist Party. 
and we have Deepak Bhatt here. I think he'll be able to enlighten us uh, more about what's happening. But in recent weeks, there has been a you know very acrimonious exchange of letters uh, between uh, uh, the co-chairman, the two co-chairmen, Prachand and uh, Prime Minister Oli. Uh, you know, there's been a meeting between Prime Minister Oli and uh, Sher Bahadur Deoba of the Nepali Congress. You know, there are also reports that the Chinese ambassador has been very active uh, in trying to patch up things within the Nepalese Communist Party. So the situation is somewhat uh, confusing. And, you know, there's all kinds of rumors and speculations uh, going on uh, in terms of what is going to happen. Uh, you know, will the party survive intact? Will the party break? Uh, you know, could there be midterm elections? Uh, you know, so all kinds of speculation. So it's 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 you know it's a confusing uh, uh, situation and you know a lot seems to be going on now as far as india is concerned i think we have taken a conscious decision and rightly so that independent of the do domestic political turmoil and churning that's going on uh, uh, in nepal it's not a good idea to you know hold up our bilateral cooperation uh, to the domestic political processes in Nepal. Uh, you know, I think in the past we were waiting for some sort of political stability uh, to emerge before uh, initiating a dialogue. But I think, you know, the, the, the uh, assessment right now seems to be that, uh, and rightly so, that our bilateral cooperation is very, very important. Uh, and, you know, we, we shouldn't have too long a hiatus. And so we've had the visit of, uh, the, you know, our head of the external intelligence. Uh, we've had our army chief's visit. Uh, uh, as Director V.I.S. mentioned, our foreign secretary is going there. Uh, and uh, I believe there is likely to be a joint commission meeting at the foreign minister's level uh, in Delhi uh, uh, sometime later. So clearly, uh, I think our bilateral relationship and cooperation uh, is back on track. And I think this is a very, very positive uh, 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 development and uh, you know I, I you know i think there has been a very positive gesture during uh, general narwane's visit when he was made the honorary general of the nepalese army and that's symbolically very important for the relationship between the two countries and the two armies i think we also now need a substantive uh, gesture or a some substantive agreement you know something that will catch the imagination of the peoples uh, of the two countries and really contribute uh, to further strengthening the relationship. And one low-hanging fruit, I think, is the Pancheshwar uh, uh, multi-purpose project on the River Mahakali. Uh, as you know, the River Mahakali has in recent months been a, become a bone of contention because of the boundary uh, dispute uh, uh, between the two countries. I think we should really now make this river a river of cooperation. And I think the Pancheshwar project is something that can do exactly that. And the de joint DPR for the project is almost ready. There are one or two outstanding issues. And I think those need to be sorted out at a political level. And I hope very much that during the uh, visit of the foreign secretary, uh, progress will be made so that it could be announced uh, by the two foreign ministers. So I think, you know, this is a very, very important project. It will transform the economy of uh, Kumau in Uttarakhand and of uh, far western Nepal, which is a relatively uh, backward area. So I think, you know, that is one thing that I feel is uh, 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 important uh, to do. Second aspect, I think, is, you know, we have two other major hydropower projects. And, you know, together, these three projects will mean investment of billions of U.S. dollars into the Nepalese economy. The other two projects, of course, the Arun 3 project is doing well. This is being undertaken by Satsu Jal Vikas Nigam in eastern Nepal. But the third project, uh, which is being done by a private company, GMR, seems to have got stuck. And, you know, while this is a private sector project, I think uh, a lot rides uh, on the successful implementation of this project. And I think, uh, you know, the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India should get involved and see what the problems are and try uh, and resolve these problems. So, you know, if, if we can move ahead on some of these issues, I think uh, it's going to be very, very significant. Somehow, in the context of India-Nepal relations, we attach a lot of em emphasis on our political cooperation. I think the time has now come to put a lot of em em emphasis 
on our economic cooperation. And in this context, I also want to mention, you know, we've set up a joint uh, project monitoring and review committee uh, uh, with Nepal. And I was seeing recently that the committee met only after one year. And, you know, this is too long a, a gap. It should meet every three months because the idea is to resolve all the pending issues and obstacles that come up in the implementation of projects. So even though the political relationship may be difficult, I think our economic cooperation, as Arvind said, uh, must continue uh, 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 unimpeded. Coming to some bilateral political issues, I think the Nepalese side is very keen uh, to begin uh, talks, uh, FS level talks on the boundary issue. And the second thing they're very keen is on the uh, EPG report, the report of uh, the M report uh, which uh, you know has not been received or accepted by the two governments and you know on this i feel that uh, the uh, fs level talks on the boundary have to begin but we have one confusion in our minds uh, in india and that is that you now in nepal have a constitutional amendment so i think uh, india would need some assurance from nepal that any boundary settlement agreed between the two governments will meet uh, parliamentary approval. It will be endorsed uh, by the two-thirds majority in parliament, which means that basically all the political leaders of the parties represented in parliament uh, have, to, have to provide uh, this mandate. Now, on the EPG report, you know, it's been two years uh, since this report was finalized and we uh, have not uh, accepted it as yet. And I think one of the reasons uh, was that there was some confusion as to whether the recommendations of such a report would be binding or not. And I think that has been clarified that these are not binding. The two governments can decide what they want to do with the report. But clearly the fact that India has not accepted the report for two years means that we have some difficulties with the report. So I think the time has come uh, during the Foreign Secretary's visit to explain our stand very clearly to the Nepalese side uh, on the EPG report. And what I understand from informal uh, conversation with Nepalese friends, that the most important issue for them in the report is the 1950 treaty. So I think, uh, you know, we've already established the foreign secretary mechanism uh, to look at reviewing the treaty. And India is very open. Prime Minister Modi said so in 2014 from a public platform that we are prepared to review the treaty and look at any proposals that Nepal has. So I think this matter can also be taken up in the foreign secretary level discussion. And, you know, these have become irritants in the relationship. And I think it is time that we sort of uh, move ahead on this. Now, on China, I think, you know, uh, recently reports have come in. Uh, uh, A, first, of course, the ambassador of China met the Nepalese prime minister very late in the evening when this political turmoil was going, in, going on in Nepal. Uh, assumption being that she was trying to patch up things within the Nepalese uh, Communist Party. And then there have been reports that the Chinese defense minister is likely to visit Nepal, uh, you know, very, very soon after the foreign secretary's visit. And, you know, to me, this seems somewhat insensitive on the part of Nepal, uh, uh, especially uh, at a time when the India-China relationship and especially on the defense side, the military side is so tense uh, to invite the Chinese defense minister somehow gives the impression that the Nepalese uh, are not bothered too much about Indian uh, uh, sensitivities. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, they want to balance, uh, you know, the relation, the, 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 the visit of our army chief with the uh, Chinese defense minister. But I just find this a little unusual. And this is the second visit of the Chinese defense minister to, to Nepal in two years, uh, in two or three years. And, you know, there is not too much happening, and General Katwal will testify, there's not too much happening in terms of cooperation between the two armies, between the PLA and the Royal uh, and the Nepalese army. Of course, there have been some uh, joint exercises. Uh, so it's not very clear in terms of, you know, what this uh, visit implies or signifies. Uh, 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 and, you know, perhaps our Nepalese colleagues, uh, you know, would, would enlighten us. Uh, 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 you know, on this app. situation. 
and there is a very strong feeling especially amongst the communist parties that the indo pacific uh, uh, approach or the indo pacific policy is aimed against uh, china and that in fact it is in opposition to the belt and road initiative of china so if nepal somehow uh, 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 participates in the indo pacific uh, uh, processes then in some sense uh, you know it is against china and this seems to be the very strong perception uh, within the nepalese communist party and so the americans had come up with a 500 million dollar grant free assistance program for construction of electricity transmission lines and rural roads 500 million dollars grant free under the millennium challenge corporation and this whole project has been held up on you know because Uh, some people in the ruling party feel this is part of indo pacific and indo pacific is something uh, that the chinese don't like and so nepal uh, shouldn't uh, uh, go into it and interestingly it's the people opposed to oli that is prachand and jhalanath khanal and so on who are very sensitive uh, to chinese concerns vis-a-vis -vis mcc whereas prime minister oli in fact uh, supporting the mcc uh, project so this is another issue in the very confusing uh, 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 you know political uh, 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 debates uh, in 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 nepal uh, i just want to conclude uh, uh, now uh, by saying that um, uh, you know there is somehow so much has happened in nepal uh, you know with the new constitution a lot of transitions from a monarchy to a republic uh, 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 you know from uh, uh, secular from a hindu to a secular country wanting to graduate now to a developing country status uh, and you know the new constitution is a big uh, achievement but somehow the peace and prosperity dividend that was expected out of all these very dramatic changes in nepal has has really not uh, happened and not occurred and as a result of which i think uh, you know there is a certain amount of discontent and i haven't mentioned covid but one of the reasons why there has been a lot of criticism of the oli government is the handling of covid and especially the economic uh, fallout so in conclusion i really want to say that i hope uh, india and nepal can really focus very strongly now on the economic cooperation on our trade and investment relations Uh, and, and, and really, you know, deal with the sort of bread and butter issues uh, that face the people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ray, for uh, uh, outlining the important uh, issues in India-Nepal relations. And I'm sure uh, uh, some of these issues will be taken up uh, during the Foreign Secretary's uh, visit. And uh, if there is. Uh, uh, political will on uh, both sides uh, certainly uh, progress can be made on uh, uh, some of these issues and uh, i agree with you uh, that uh, the uh, focus should uh, really shift to economic uh, cooperation uh, the uh, other issues can be discussed uh, in the various uh, mechanisms that have been set up and we look forward to uh, the suggestions uh, from Our Nepalese, uh, yes, on some of the points uh, that you have uh, raised. Now I request uh, General Katwal to kindly make his uh, remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon to you all. Once again, happy to see you. some of you that i know of quite well like ambassador ray we have talked to a lot many times to each other happy to see you once again well uh, gentlemen uh, i don't belong to any political parties or any organization i am an uh, a free citizen of a free country that's what i keep on saying it and i would like to share my opinion and it, my opinion may not be uh, to the liking of many of you but that is the, that is i feel strongly the truth that exists between these two countries 
because Nepal and India cannot remain without talking, without negotiating. That is the dictation of the of the geography that no one can change it. We cannot change it. Despite all that multi tiered relations, multifaceted, multi dimensional relation that we have, the bilateral relation right, right now is dominated by the distrust and 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 the, the doubts that we know of. Now, what are these doubts and distrust that trust deficit that it's causing us for a long time? Why India is India and Nepal are not trusting to each other? What is that? So we've got to go into details, try and find out the correct diagnosis and come out with the correct treatment. And for that, I believe that we need to delve into something that is the perceptions that we have, the mindset that we have, the perception that the India has it and the perception that Nepal has it. In my opinion, India's perception about Nepal is Nepal has been an willing host of many anti-Indian forces, causing a, a very a great threat to the Indian uh, uh, security overall. And uh, uh, the Nepalese perception has been that India has been causing a, a very constant uh, instability in Nepal in every aspect because India tries to uh, micromanage the internal affairs of Nepal and tries to take undue advantage despite uh, the, the size and uh, the, the developments, the level of developments, despite the uh, similar history, the, the similar political system, the religions, the language and culture that we have. This trust deficit has been dominating and creating irritants and frictions uh, uh, quite a many times. And to, uh, you know, to go into details, what are the, the what are the causes uh, the, these uh, these distress and doubts has been uh, existing uh, within these two countries? Because as I say, as I keep on saying it, the rivers flowing from the Himalayas would always flow to the Ganges. By mistake, even they flow back to Brahmaputra, they will again come down to uh, come down to India. That is the natural dictation that we cannot change it. I've said it already. Now, as I see it. You know the uh, the, uh, uh, the the collaborations, uh, the uh, the uh, political patronage that was provided uh, to a then uh, uh, terrorist Maoist in India, they were provided safety, security, and then sanctuary. Almost a half of the time of ten years of armed conflict in Nepal, and because of the collaborations between the uh, uh, the, the the Indians and the Maoist and particularly the EU and the Americans. Because of that collaborations, the uh, India took an initiative because the monarchy had been, uh, you know, almost uh, creating this uh, this problem against India and, and at times uh, playing a so-called China card. So it is uh, wise enough to, uh, to abolish monarchy, declare Nepal a uh, secular, uh, federal and then and, 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 and republic uh, states. Uh, and, and that is the initiative that India took it and the political parties of Nepal accepted that. Now, let's find out whether the uh, Chinese influence that we have in Nepal, is it remaining at 2006 level? It is diminished to the, uh, to the, to the zero level or it is rising. It is all, uh, it is for us to see all. It is there and you know it. Ambassador Ray just raised some of that points again, you know, that is what it is. So we've got to, you know, uh, uh, find out uh, what are the the, the truth uh, that is uh, lying behind. Go into detail to try to find out and and correct, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 treatment uh, for these. So uh, maybe we'd like to go, you know, uh, for an independent introspection in India and independent introspections uh, in in Nepal and try to find out what are the reality that is causing all these difficulties between these two countries, which should not have been happen uh, happening, you know, because we, we cannot remain like, like what uh, the situation right now. And hopefully uh, the, the visit of the Indian chief, well, uh, well, after the dinner, I told him, chief, you try and break this ice. You've got to do it. And he said very kindly, he said, I'll try. I'll try, he said. And then the visit of uh, Samantha Kumar, 
and the, uh, the the coming visit of the foreign secretary would set a scene where the two countries would start talking and trying to resolve all these issues, including the border issue, the Kalapani, Lipu Lake and Limpia Dura and Susta, all that. You've got to do it. You know, you've got to be very practical uh, in this. Let's try and sit down right from the days of Sugoli Treaty, keep all the facts and figures, also historical things, and all, all understanding and certificates, and sit down on the table and discuss it, and try and find out what is the reality. So we've got to, you know, uh, uh, remove this distrust that is existing uh, between us. And then we might go for the corrective measures if there are any, you know. Are we happy? Is India happy? What is, is what is happening in Nepal right now? Is India happy? I'm sure I'm going to raise it again that what should have been happening is not happening in Nepal. Is it what we wanted in Nepal? Of course not. So what are the what are the uh, uh, the, the realities uh, that should come in between? So it's a question of reviving our trust, honoring the Lakshman Rekha. And then, you know, the, uh, the distrust that keeps on causing, like, for example, the EPG. Why, why the, the prime ministers and the Indian government and the Nepalese government, you know, established this EPG. And then after two years of preparing their rec recommendation, the Indian government doesn't want to see it. Why? These are the kind of distrust that creates, you know, uh, you know, you know uh, trust deficit. So we've got to remove and march forward, you know, to marching forward. There is no alternative to it between these two countries, but it, because that is what uh, that is what the uh, geography has decided, and we cannot change it. And then I hope things should settle down once your foreign secretary visits us. I hope we can sit down at the table, talk to us, you know, uh, and uh, with the, with the realities, with the with the uh, geographical setup that we have, and then march forward because India as a, as the largest democracy. As uh, as a, as a uh, uh, rising power and trying to become the uh, the uh, member of the Security Council of the United Nations with the veto power, should I think uh, display some larger heart to its smaller neighbor, so that it can have greater voice, influential voice in the international stage. That's what India hopes, and I hope the smaller country would would uh, you know uh, would we are are willing to uh, see that happening because the smaller country always wanted something you know uh, something some generosity from india that's what it is and as an equal sovereign nation uh, that's what i expect and that is my opinion i hope you'll accept it because we've got to go down to find out what are the basic needs the basic truth so we've got to act on that and move forward as two people as two nations because we cannot change it there are so many things that keeps on binding us together even if we don't like it you know that's what it is thank you gentlemen thank you so much Thank you, Janak Katwal, for those uh, uh, remarks. And uh, you have uh, underlined the need to look into the realities of uh, India-Nepal relations in order to uh, address the uh, prevailing distrust. And you also made uh, certain suggestions. Thank you very much. Uh, now I uh, request uh, General uh, Rakesh Sharma make his uh, remarks. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen, ladies. Uh, good, uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, Dr. Gupta, for inviting me to speak today. And Jay Gorak to all my uh, uh, friends and leaders from Nepal. Uh, I have had 40 years in the Gurkhas in, uh, in Indian Army. And in 40 years, I must have visited Nepal about 30, 40 times, tracked and I saw uh, the, the people and the culture is as known to us as uh, the Indian culture. So I would, uh, in the course of next 10 odd minutes, want to uh, talk about some plain talking also, like General Katwal has done, as to what needs to be done on a relationship with Nepal. Now, with the passage of time, uh, it is evident and we've seen people coming from Nepal and we work. And and I hope lifestyles and things as uh, then what's uh, previously being done. So there is a there is an obvious change which is happening uh, in the in the Nepali society over uh, a period of time, and uh, of course this has manifested itself into 
um, the, um, the the secular democratic republic and and of course the new constitution which has come into being after a long time all this matters i think four major changes i like to bring about uh, i would like to highlight first is that the strategic geography is changing the, the change of strategic geography is very material in nepal that because of the roads and the railways that are coming from across the himalayas the importance of himalayas itself is being denigrated and you know the, if the train comes up next year from lhasa to kathmandu and it comes down further towards terai and also the roads that are coming up either towards okladunga or towards dharchula in both sides there is a tremendous amount of change happening in the strategic geography of nepal and it is absolutely relevant in this context second is there is a change of the nepali society because of globalization because of this culture there are large scale migration people say 25% of the nepalis stay outside nepal there are about 8 billion dollars worth of uh, uh, remittances that come across uh, in, in 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 nepal so it's one of the highest remittances uh, remittances that can be brought about there and the destinations of the nepalis people of course there are 8 million in india and there are about 6 lakh 6 lakh uh, indians working in nepal but the larger migrations are taking place from nepal is to middle east to southeast asia to hong kong even to united states so there is a cultural shift happening there is a cosmopolitanism that is coming up in nepal which is most different than what we saw in the in the 70s 80s 90s now there is a total change is happening and it's very relevant in the context of what the people of nepal want in future the uh, the third part is of course the issue of uh, the uh, altering uh, threats and challenges also to nepal there is they, they, we follow what happen what's happening in nepal there are issues of terrorism energy security supply security disaster management there are so many challenges coming up in nepal itself and as it gets more and more cosmopolitan and as in as in when more and more students go across for studying there and come back or don't come back there is going to be a major shift into the security challenges that nepal also feel now i come to the issue of cliches we have been talking too many cliches over a very long period of time roti beti karista this has been a, like a cliche which has been spoken over or um, uh, from 50s onwards or uh, as somebody said nepal is yam between two boulders i think we need to get out of this cliche part of our relationship because the this cliches are passed behind us they are not as relevant as they used to be in times to come and despite all these uh, um, issues which have been raised and general katwal also rightly mentioned the relationship has got still substantial amount of robustness and they uh, despite all linkages that being established the nepalese trade with india is actually uh, growing and it's going uh, steadily of course it's going in favor of india and uh, two, two third of this uh, nepalese external trade is actually with india this reflects that there is the advantage of geography which is important both physical and societal and then of course all these projects which ambassador rays also mentioned the arun arun 3 arun 3 will make transformative changes in nepal so then you know all this is happening which is also the issue of nepali's currency it's pegged to the indian currency it matters uh, to the relationship how currency moves between uh, two, two nations and it's a rarest of the rare thing of course there are large amount of negatives and we understand that the psyche of people and especially the people who come to us in india and soldiering tell us that the psyche on uh, the blockade that happened in 2015 16 is unable to be got out of the people it remains in their mind it is it hurts them tremendously to think of 2015 and 16 and this has to be assuaged because the society feels so and second is the issue of uh, um uh, you know uh, the kind of thought process that we have been big brotherly or we have been interfering with the constitution those issues are there but then there is a nationalism of uh, brought about by the political parties in nepal which is significantly anti indian and you know uh, it it comes out in the media it comes out also in the writings and it also comes out as to we learn here now 
is there a, a, a amended paradigm in relationship as has been referred to uh, there is uh, there are issues to be built on firstly as i said let's get out of these cliches of the past and try to assuage the feelings of the hurt which exists in the nepalese society it requires india to take many steps forward on this score but there is a police political desire seemingly in the course of last 6 months and even more to get out of this distrust there have been no adverse statements coming out from indian polity in the course of this year or even before which are anti nepal in fact there has been uh, uh, you know one can read into a caution being imposed on and anything adverse being said on uh, so the distrust is being attempted to be removed the prime minister talks on the independence day and the 17th august meeting between the uh, foreign secretary of nepal and the indian delegation i think that was a great plus because large number of issues got discussed in august this year uh, which was ha- happening after a long time we have territorial issues between uh, between india and nepal uh, we know that there is a uh, um, uh, thing passed in the legislature which needs to be uh, parliament which needs to be sorted out but all that requires deft handling and i think there may be better mechanisms available globally where uh, issues of this kind exist where we can find a via media of uh, uh, adjusting to this issue there are great hydro uh, uh, potential available arun 3 we must get sorted out also pancheshwar pancheshwar has been hanging fire for such a long time we've heard pancheshwar first time in 90s this is 2020 Where, and if the DPRs are now being readied, and you know, uh, is there a uh, you know many people in Nepal tell us that we, they feel that the Indian projects go very slow. Uh, there may be land issues, there may be issues of finality of financial closures, etc. But we need to move ahead and sort out the issues of the projects that India accepts to build, and we need to move forward on this issue. And I have an issue about Haldia and Vaisa. Uh, in our discussions also we feel that they uh, it is felt in nepal that the haldia and the vaisa ports which are available for uh, transportation of goods have not been responding the best manner the time taken from haldia to reach kathmandu is much larger i think we, we in india could work to sort out the uh, transportation of goods that come from vaisa and haldia uh, for each other so the second issue is the backbone of our relationship relates to military now a lot of things have been said even by the defense minister of nepal and many things are uh, emanate from both sides but the fact of the matter is that it is the bedrock of this foundation it's the rarest of the rare cases where um, uh, uh, nepalese uh, soldiers happily and willingly work and serve in the indian army have proven their metal have proven themselves in all wars and you know they are actually the backbone of the indian army so this relationship whether it affects the politics is not material but then there is an importance of this relationship uh, between nepal um, the, the, the troops which come came from nepal and come to india we could have about 30 35000 nepalese troops working in india uh, and s- soldiering across here and doing fantastic amount of work the amount of work that the indian army does to the uh, settlers the pensioners who are settled there or the echs being medical facilities being provided down in nepal all this is a very strong uh, bondage which must be built on and it cannot be pushed aside i think nepal also needs to think a little bit about our concerns on china now the relationship that china is developing and we ha- we are students of china and what china has been doing inside nepal we are well aware and as jan katwar was mentioning what things have changed in the course of last 15 years let like things have changed much to the worse including the relationship between the two communist parties and the training of the communist parties uh, uh, ccp of, of the communist party in nepal or the confucius centers or the china study centers or the larger number of students now going across to china to study all that is well aware of us we do have as as a uh, dear colleagues from nepal would understand we have serious concerns about china and we need to work to this end to find the answer to this one as to you know our concerns our anxieties how our anxieties can be uh, addressed on the issues of china and last my issue here before i conclude is that uh, 
know, the traditional aspects of our relationship cannot be forgotten. We are also a secular nation as Nepal is. But there is a tradition, there is a, there, uh, there is a Nath Parampara which binds us. There is a Goraknath, Goraknath who came and settled, who did, who prayed. Of course, these things are cliches. They have been spoken over a long period of time. But how can we avoid the Nath Parampara? How can we avoid Goraknath temple? How can we avoid uh, thinking that the Nepalese army celebrates its raising day on the Mahashivaratri? Or uh, for that matter, there is relationship to the Trishul and the Damru. Uh, in the flags, so you know there is a, there is a, a binding relationship, traditional relationship between our two nations, and this uh, needs to be honed up. The, uh, you know, it's centuries old. We just cannot forget and avoid our relationship. This one, to me, and summing up, I would say that this Purano Samband and a Naya Vastha. Uh, there is historic relationship. But the historic relationship is now to build up on a new environment. And this two new environment is totally different than environment, even what existed, say, five to ten years ago. It is so dynamically changing. So there is collaboration necessary. There has to be purposeful partnership on each of these avenues. And it is possible to be done between two nations. We are both two equal nations. We are both sovereign nations. We are not big brothers or no, not elder brothers. We are friends. And that's the way we need to work on this uh, causes of distrust and discuss all issues and also India's security concerns uh, uh, on uh, China issues. Thank you very much for our, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk today, sir. Thank you, uh, General Sharma. It's interesting that you uh, started with the uh, uh, the advice that we should overcome cliches, but came back to discussing paraprahas. I think it's uh, very difficult to uh, overlook uh, the historical connections and uh, cultural uh, uh, connects. So that will always uh, be a very important part. And uh, as uh, uh, you mentioned, geography also. Uh, but you also have a very balanced uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much for that. Now, I request uh, Shri Udirana, uh, the former State Finance uh, Minister, kindly make his uh, remarks. Is it my turn? Yes, Udeji, up, up, it's your turn. Can you hear me? Shri Udeji, can you hear me? Who's turn? Aapki, but Shri Uday, Uday, Uday Rana Ji. Yeah. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, thank you very much, organizers, for giving me a chance to speak. Nepal uh, Nepal shares borders, as as all of you know, with India and China. While the relations with both the neighbors are of the highest priority, the geographical reality, historical, socio-economic, and cultural affinities make ties with India operational on daily basis, both at the people's and government level more important than with China. Year 2020 will be marked by a downturn in Nepal-India relations with decreasing trust between Kathmandu and New Delhi. After the Kalapani border dispute, Although harmful, such tensions aren't something new to both the countries. In the past 20 years, the bilateral relations hasn't remained constant, but has witnessed ups and downs at different junctures. After the Kalapan border dispute and thereafter Nepal's new map was redrawn in May 2020, the relations further deteriorated and there are no high 
I, uh, there has been no high level dialogues between the two na nations until very recently. The re recent visit of Mr. S.K. Goel, chief, uh, chief of RAW, got a bit con controversial here in Nepal. However, I see it's quite natural uh, and normal for an intelligent chief of a neighboring country to visit a friendly country and take stock about security issues and concerns. It is not the first time a chief of RAW has made a visit to Nepal. In fact, most raw, uh, raw chiefs have visited Nepal in their tenure. However, there are certain questions being raised here about his visit to Nepal. One, the timing of the visit. Second, why did only the prime minister meet Mr. Goel? He should have met with his Nepalese counterpart, with the head of security agencies, secretaries and ministers and had a detailed detail conversation with him prior to, uh, prior to uh, calling on the prime minister as a courtesy call. See, normally the visit of head of intelligence to another country is not made very public. But this visit was publicized, especially by the Nepali side. And lastly, questions being raised, especially by the PM Oli's own wondering what happened to the ultra-nationalist ultra and anti-Indian posture that the PM demonstrated prior coming to power. This visit was closely followed by the visit of chief of the army staff to Kathmandu on 4th November, mainly to confer the rank of honorary, honorary general. As for the long-standing tradition between the Nepal and India, the chief of the armies of both countries are conferred with, with this title. This is an old tradition between the two armies and not much needs to be read between the lines. However, this has laid the foundation for the foundation for reconciliation between Nepal in India, and also the upcoming crucial visit of the Indian Foreign Secretary later this month for a formal dialogue with his Nepalese counterpart. The dynamics of Nepal-India relation has been linked with the domestic politics and development in two countries. Unlike Nepal's relations with other countries, Indo-Nepal relations tend to get easily politicized due to the domestication of relations. There has been a tendency to link each domestic issue with India. Nepal, India generally, relations generally fall, play, fall prey to the domestic politics and the current incumbent government shouldn't leverage their foreign policy for domestic popularity. There is a tendency in Nepal, especially the incumbent government, to ignite da da dangerous jignism amongst the public while only hampers the relations between the two countries. The unwarranted nationalist posture is nothing but a facade to cover up the unfulfilled promises and a short-term political mileage for the political leaders. Nepal's communist parties of all colors and sizes have turned to nationalism, often equated to anti-Indianism, to play the domestic politics. At the same time, the Indian policymakers also must not be reactive or be influenced by the media tirade and fall into the trap and end up hurting the sentiment of the common people by the rash actions. The example being the informal blo blockade that was imposed by India in 2015 after the earthquake and pro promulgation of the constitution, which in turn led to the rise of KP Oli from one of the senior communist leader to the undisputed leader of the NCP. Oli shrewdly played the Indian, Indian sentiment and was one of the factors for NCP's uh, election victory, victory uh, garnering two-thirds of majority in the parliament, winning six of the seven provincial elections. Even the uh, recent cartographic war provided KP Oli a lifeline as he was being cornered by his own party, party members. History is a witness that political and strategic powers follow power. The increased attention in the region is not without considerable significance for Nepal. China's involvement not only in the Himalayan region, but also in the Indo-Pacific region and in other parts of the world is quite but natural. Until recently, Nepal had a hands-off policy in Nepal. China had a hands-off policy in Nepal and always supported the government in power since the establishment of Nepal-China diplomatic relations in 1955. However, this seems to be changing. I would like to give two recent examples. One, on the 15th of June, one day virtual work was held between the CCP and NCP leaders. Participation included Deputy Prime Minister, 
of Nepal, co-chair of NCP, various other leaders at the time, when relations with India and China were at a crucial juncture after the violent clash between soldiers of two countries along the disputed border in Ladakh. Also on September 2019, NCP organized a two-day training pro program on Xi Jinping thoughts just days before the Chinese president's official visit to Nepal. It is unprecedented that the party to training program is conducted and given priority over the official visit. Both these programs were criticized by the opposition party and others. Second, the recent proactive role of the Chinese embassy in Kathmandu and the meeting of the Chinese ambassador with senior NCP has raised eyebrows. This is not a problem. Diplomats meet political leaders, businessmen, bureaucrats, members of the civil society, etc. But the timing of the me meeting makes it very interesting, as it was during the height of infighting, may suggest attempts to hold the NCP leadership to together. To insulate the often volatile foreign and political relation between Nepal and India, it is important the economic issues are given greater priority. Out of Nepal's total international trade, 64.7% is with India, and more than 90% of international trade is either with India or via India. Fiscal year, the total export to India was Nepalese rupees 46 billion, and import from India was Nepalese rupees 633 billion. Import is nearly 13 times more than the export. Trade deficit is one of our biggest problems. The ongoing fundamental transformation in India and China has brought in an unprecedented range of opportunity and challenges at Nepal's doorstep. Nepal can find a better place in the emerging world order by reprising its historical role as a land bridge between India and China, and also an era of cooperation for both countries and not conflict. Nepal needs to work wisely to benefit from its proximities of these economy, economic powerhouses and contribute to the construction of a shared, peaceful, stable, democratic and prosperous order. China has in, in emerged as the most influential actor in Nepal's investment and development sector and thereby also as a key factor in Nepal's internal politics, thus displacing India. China has made inroads in Nepal, increasing investment in crucial sectors like hydropower, trade, investment, post-earthquake, reconstruct, and tourism. It has been the biggest FDI contributor in Nepal for the last four years. Nepal's assistance, China's assistance to Nepal shouldn't be perceived as Nepal is growing closer to China visa and vice versa. Nepal has, has to balance both its neighbors <clears throat> and not allow Nepali soil as a ground for either anti-Indian or anti-Chinese activity. Delay in Indian funded projects has been a major irritant to Nepal-India relationship, re relationship. For example, the Hulaki Rajmag and Jogmani Biratnagar railway links. These projects were initiated almost 20 years back. Faced with major knowledge gap in land and have seen these projects. Promised Indian pro reconstruction not been forthcoming, while the Chinese funded projects are also at times delayed, but not to that extent. Nepal being a landlocked country and more than 90% of its trade either with India or via India, the movement of good between the two border points need to be smooth and quick to facilitate economic growth. Keeping this in mind, Nepal and India signed an agreement in 2005 to construct four integrated check posts, ICP, in four border points. Birganj Raksol, Biratnagar Jogmani, Bhairava Sunauli, Nepal Ganj Rupadia. At the moment, two are in operational, namely the Bhairava Raksol and Bir Biratnagar Jogmani, former being the more important point in terms of total volume of trade. <clears throat> However, excuse me. However, there are some major problems that need to be looked into and ratified. One, the parking facilities that should have been made according to the requirements. However, the size of the parking for cargo trucks at ICP on both sides are identical, even though import share in Birganj is much greater than export. There's hardly, hardly any additional space to divert traffic. Nepali cargoes are arriving from the third country are discharged at Kolkata port. The standard turnaround time range from 14 to 21 days, but the average time taken by a Nepali importer to send back the empty container is approximately 42 days. 
Due to this and congestion at Kolkata port, Nepali traders incur heavy financial losses and also due to detention charges. The Birganj Laksol ICP is built adjacent to the rail track, but not under the premises of ICP. The train goes directly to Birganj Dry Port after its inspection at the Raksol Customs Office, bypassing the ICP. Nepal's open border with India comes with a certain security problem. The movement of open border calls for a cold, close cooperation and increased intelligence sharing between the concerned agencies of two countries and must be instructed to work closely. There are few who want, the close, who want to close the border, but the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. You cannot take away anyone's li livelihood or freedom enjoy, enjoying for generations. In the 21st century, when many countries are bringing down barriers and encouraging through free movement of labor, capital, and technology, why do we want to move backwards? And if, if those in Nepal who want a hard border between Nepal and India and eager to replace the existing special relationship should seriously consider, think, and con contemplate beyond the chest thumping nationalist attitude and about our borderland communities, which is very important, I feel. There is a saying, if your hand pains, you apply or take medicines. You do not chop it off. Same with the border. It has to be managed, not blocked. 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship between Nepal and India reflects the depth of Nepal-India friendship. There is a strong interest, especially in Nepal, to review the 1950 Treaty. As it has been 70 years since the treaty was signed, much has changed. Many of the articles in the treaty has become non- or outdated. However, Article 6 and 7 of the treaty, which obligates each of the state to extend reciprocal rights to the citizens of the other with respect to participation in industrial and economic development, trade and commerce, residence and ownership of property and work in each other's te territory. Many families has, have been residing and working in another country for generations while maintaining one's original citizenship. This provision needs to be maintained, otherwise will have adverse effect, effect a, adversely affect large number of people in both countries. With lessons from the past and change, changing global order, Nepal-India relationship needs to be revisited. Coordination and consultation has to be stepped up, not only between the two governments, but has to be expanded beyond the power corridors of Kathmandu and New Delhi. People-to-people -people relations are vital, Needs, requirements, and wants of those people living in the other country has to be given priority. The migrant population in both countries are socially, politically, and economically not influential. Hence, their voices are seldom heard. We have, to, we, we have spent too much time and energy squabbling over political issues that never seem to have an ending or have a favorable out outcome for both sides. Keeping this in mind, now we need to give more leverage to the socio-economic aspects of Nepal-India relation. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, remarks. And I think uh, you also echoed the feeling that uh, we must uh, move uh, to strengthen our economic uh, relationship, uh, which is uh, very important and which is uh, languishing. And you have given a number of uh, important uh, suggestions uh, in this regard. Another, uh, I think, uh, important point you made was that we need to go beyond the chest thumping uh, nationalism, which comes in the way of uh, developing uh, our relationship. And uh, you have uh, also uh, argued for a revisit of uh, Nepal India relationship, but uh, this should not. Uh, necessarily mean that we close the borders and also uh, harm the livelihoods, etc. of so many people who are working in each other's countries. So thank you very much for uh, those uh, remarks. Now I uh, request Shri Sanjay Chadda to kindly make his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It's an honor to speak to this distinguished uh, audience, sir and I'm privileged to be here. So I would uh, be restricting my talks on the trade portion 
And as you all know that the bilateral framework for trade is anchored on the India-Nepal Treaty of Trade and Agreement of Cooperation to Control Unauthorized Trade. So this treaty is normally valid for a period of seven years and it keeps getting uh, extended uh, from time to time. It's a very liberal treaty in which uh, we have given access to Nepalese manufactured product on a non-reciprocal basis and given them access to the Indian market. Uh, of course, there are issues which always keep cropping up, but then uh, if we look at the total trade of Nepal, which is a little over $12 billion, around uh, eight and a half billion is with uh, India, sir. And of course, uh, the figure used to be something close to 95% in uh, 62, but it's uh, come down substantially. And uh, uh, notwithstanding that, sir, there are a lot of areas where the potential still lies uh, untapped. For instance, uh, we have a huge potential in water resources cooperation and energy cooperation, sir. Now, this is something, sir, that has been uh, on, on talk for quite some time. There have been uh, uh, various mechanisms which have been set in. There are some flagship projects which were announced the Arun 3 between subject uh, SJBNL and the Investment Board of Nepal. Of course, that project is uh, achieved financial closure. It's underway. The Pancheshwar multipurpose project, sir, which was signed as way back in 96 under the Mahakali Treaty between India and Nepal. It's a huge, gigantic project, 5,600 megawatts and the largest possible project for us also. It has an irrigation potential of 130,000 hectares in Nepal and 240,000 hectares in uh, India, sir. So the, if we look at examples, we find that the best example of such a cooperation is the Columbus Water Treaty between Canada and US. Sir. The treaty is so beneficial to both sides that projects which have been initiated in Canada provide tremendous benefits to both the countries Canada sells the entire power to the United States, which is generated from these dams on the British Columbia. It has an immense flood moderation potential, sir. The river flows downstream are immensely controlled. So these are areas, sir, where I think uh, in particular, UP and Bihar would benefit greatly if we were to look at or contemplate such a treaty with Nepal. It would hugely increase their GDP like Bhutan, they would have a tremendous amount of uh, money coming in from their hydro resources. There are a large number of Indian companies which can partner with the Nepalese investment boards so that uh, there is duality of control on these hydro projects. And I think uh, India being a huge power market, it, it, it is an area where the potential is immense. And we have for some reason uh, over the last few decades, been uh, not able to uh, harness this potential, if I may say so, sir. So there is also a great deal of uh, talk. My predecessor spoke about the the Jogbani, Biratnagar uh, rail links, the ICD Concor, which it is which is operating across at Birkanj. But these are only the tips of the iceberg, sir. They need backward linkages. They need linkages and inroads into the hinterland so that the integration can be more meaningful. For some reason, like uh, was said by my preceding few speakers, sir, that we need to be a little more pragmatic about how to have an integration on the economic front. There are uh, tremendous advantages on both the sides, which would come and automatically flow if we were to look at uh, uh, integrating trade, because not only are we the largest market close to Nepal, but we can also be a good source for food products, agricultural products, and other uh, products which go to, uh, which are uh, presently being uh, uh, traded by Nepal, sir. So if we see that, uh, what do we export primarily? Petroleum products, motor vehicles and spare parts, rice, some mild steel uh, equipment, machinery and parts, medicines, equipment, agricultural and electrical equipment for value addition there. So there are tremendous synergies which need to be harnessed and which can be capitalized upon. If we look at the investment front, sir, Indian firms are the largest investors in Nepal. 
but yet the potential is still not up to the par. There are about 150 companies which are working there. They work in banking, insurance, Concord works in dry ports, in education, in telecom, in tourism and power sector. Of course, there is ITC, Dabur India, Hindustan Lever, VSNL, TSIL, MTNL, SBI, PNB, LIC, I mean GMR and several, several other companies which are some of the flagship companies of India are operating there, sir. And even if you see the cooperation on tourism, sir, there is a great potential for the Buddhist circuit, sir. And somehow the Buddhist circuit is still divided into what happens in India and what happens in Nepal. Just across the border lies Lumbini, sir. And we don't have at least formalized arrangements with Nepal through which we can harness this Buddhist sector circuit, sir. This holds a great potential in tourism for the Northeast Asia. And I think uh, if we can really look at cooperating this into an integrated tour sort of a program, you know, linked by rail, linked by road, then things would be uh, beneficial for both the countries. Sir. So the uh, on uh, issues of uh, trade, I would also just like to mention that uh, we are looking at uh, new partnerships in agricultural research and development. The uh, predominantly, of course, Nepal has a predominant uh, dependence on agriculture. Food processing holds a tremendous potential in Nepal, sir. There can be a lot of synergies in companies going across, investing in food processing. But as was mentioned, sir, that a lot of this can happen uh, based upon a greater political bonhomie and a greater geopolitical understanding between the two sides, sir. So I think uh, I would just like to also add, sir, that uh, if you recall that when the 2015 devastating earthquake happened, sir, it was uh, uh, the NDRF and other, other uh, Indian assistance was provided very timely. I think that was a very good confidence building measure and assistance which was provided, sir. And uh, we hope that uh, the partnership would be taken to the next level, sir. And uh, it would be to the mutual advantage of both the countries. Thank you very much, sir, for the time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chadda. I think uh, you're right. Uh, there is uh, untapped potential and uh, there are some uh, new areas in which I think we can uh, move in while we also resolve the uh, existing uh, problems. So the potential is there. And uh, I think the political will is uh, required. So uh, now I, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, D.P. Bhatta, Prakash Bhatta. I request him to kindly take the floor. So, but can, uh, you can you hear me? Yes, 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 I can hear you. Good afternoon, Please everyone. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Director VIF and Sunil AIDIA, uh, both uh, host organizations. I'm honored to be here to share a panel with the distinguished and as I am visiting my home adjoining the Mahagali River. And most have mentioned about Mahakali Treaty and Mahagali River, which I'm residing here and talking from here. And it's excellent to hear views from the previous speakers as you have covered range of uh, or dimensions of Nepal-India relations and definitely agreeing with the Many points raised earlier, I think time has been changing very fast and we are living in a big data world. And if we look at the changes in Nepal at the same time, there are many changes are occurring in India and Indian politics and geopolitical dynamics of India, India, Nepal, India relations, India's role in the Asia Pacific or the Indo Pacific region and the world scenario, world, world stage also. And Nepal, as it is juxtaposed between two different civilizations, 
different political systems and coping with and handling you know immediate uh, neighbors uh, is is a is is a big task and i think as the time is changing when we see political relations when it comes to the ncp ncp has been practicing democratic ex i mean parliamentary elections all these things even we talk about the maoist section of the ncp it has faced the three general elections and one provincial and the local election so whenever it comes to the ccp and the ncp it doesn't make a sense that you know keeping these bogies in the mind of the old era we have been participating and vice versa inviting ruling party of india bjp and indian national congress their plenaries and then different uh, political platforms we have been sharing so it's it's very uh, take it uh, in a comfortable way that's what i want to say and and when it comes to the uh, changes for the last seven decades nepal has remained transitional and still i saw it in a in a transition phase because federal democratic republic is yet to you know really to take a shape and in that period for the first year we have been setting up you know the new constitution how it should be uh, you know all the sharing of powers at the uh, central and the federal provincial and the local level on one side and and setting up that entering into the next year's budget and implementing all the the policies related to the prosperity of nepal we are facing covid and covid is yes covid handling covid there are some uh, problems and challenges and as mentioned by ambassador ray yes there are problems but handling covid is is completely a, a unique case which is each and every country so yes uh, we are talking about all these issue uh, also and when it comes to the nepal india relation i see it from one political relation then go government to government relation and people to people relation and sometimes it is like representatives from both the sides you know political or elected leaders or like whoever are in the responsible chairs and then it comes to the security and economic or the socio economic as uh, 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 my friend Uday was uh, raising the issues you know more socio economic or trade related issues so i think you know all these parallel things are happening and changing so the priority i think is the less is the political but things should be handled by politicians at some level and then of course the uh, routine mechanism of or uh, structures created for the joint uh, uh, you know handling of the issues at the uh, joint mechanisms so this is not happening especially after the limbia dura issue when india uh, on their uh, side they, they talk that uh, they are opening the road to the lipu lake and as we have been claiming that part belongs to nepal and similarly in the susta there's only uh, two major areas where the border disputes are occurring so that should be handled by at least for the first level directors of the survey department or the survey general of india level and then up to the diplomatic level and then up to the political level and then can go up to the highest level so this is where where the setting up mechanism is working and similarly if you look at the 96 mahakali treaty till the date the office, Panchashar office is, uh, is here. The building is next to me. And what I have seen is that the, the progress, if you talk about it, it's very, very, very slow. And who to be blamed? Both sides. And then we took more responsibility. Definitely from our side, we see India. When it comes to the uh, lower repudian rights and other issues, the pending issues we have, we have not been talking. And the news you has not been sent for the couple of months the office is almost you know like handicapped so this is one issue and meanwhile we have seen the good progress in the amlegans uh, uh, pipeline case so if we are committed then we can handle issues even if the uh, politically or some uh, you know the regular forums or the regular uh, mechanisms are not working so there are good signs also and when it comes to the nepal and china relation Yes, Nepal has signed BRI, but not a single big project is yet in, in, in the implementation. So it is uh, somewhere. But when it comes to the Arun, it is uh, a shuttle uh, handling project. It's going very in a good pace. And 
when it comes to the uh, our Indian friends see that it will change Nepal. Yes, definitely. But the, uh, India will also get benefit. And if it if Pro Manchester project is going to be completed, who is to be uh, going to take benefit? Both. So if it is the case, then why we are not seriously handling the major issues? And if we look at the you know like the Haldi Airport, or if even if we are proposing the Mundra Port in Gujarat from this uh, uh, Kanchanpur, the place where I am sitting. From here, it's only 1400, uh, 45 kilometer to the Mundra port. And we are, we are importing things to this place from Bishaka Patnam and Birgans, 1700 kilometer, then 700 kilometer um, by Nepal land. So this is the reality in Nepal, India trade relation. This is one example. So we can diversify these issues also. In terms of security and Jewish petrol things, yes, as I mentioned earlier, IPS and India's role, as we have recently seen the Beka signed, you know, the between India two plus two meeting. Yes, of course, the things are changing. So why not we can update our relations? 1950 treaty, as Ambassador Ray was mentioning about the EPG report. If we cannot accept the report, then why we should not, you know, inform the people that this is the reason that we cannot uh, accept or the point is here. So. As you were mentioning about the point also. So then what is left that the secret that we are not accepting or we are not resolving the issues. If we start negotiations, then at some point we can resolve the issue. And for that reason, we need to enter in a you know set in table and start negotiations. So and in a modern nation state, we always cannot say that religious way, uh, rotivator, rotivated relation, and all these relations that we have been. I mean, this is uh, the, not the centuries ago. This is very, uh, uh, you know, like uh, we cannot define in words movement of the people or the belief of the people uh, in a religious terms or the cultural or the civilizational terms. It's very deep. So, but in a modern nation state handling uh, way, our foreign policy should more, you know, like uh, uh, democratized, more transparent, and more what uh, rather I will say that it's not only you know, given or left over to the ambassadors and the agencies. So from that, uh, we need to come out and uh, the perspective should be uh, more uh, transparent. And of course, like, you know, when it comes to the security or military security or the defense cooperation between, it is working in the highest level for centuries. And it's still, I see that. And it is not the issue of Federal Democratic Republic that it is not accepted. It is fully supported by uh, the uh, people of Nepal, yes, smaller section is still talking about other forms of the government or the things, but it always remains in a transitional democracy. We are very young in uh, federalism, uh, federalist setup, young in uh, republic setup. So that will remain for a while because whenever society grows and in developing societies, it ha happens. As we have seen that as developing society, India has faces uh, many challenges, but as it remained as a democratic setup or the federal republic democratic setup, it has its uh, uh, good outcomes also. So we are hoping, and in terms of uh, political relations, that should be, uh, you know, like uh, more engaged. Uh, for that reason, uh, uh, as I mentioned, like, you know, the political parties should have good relations or sharing forums and uh, others also. So this way, uh, we can handle issues and uh, while it comes to the uh, some, uh, you know, like uh, Nepal and uh, China, Nepal and India, the comparison is uh, not necessary because we have different relations and the deeper relation or more dependency um, between Nepal and India. So it's not to mention time and again. So it's working. So working relation uh, or, you know, the, this particular relation should be, you know, like handled uh, by categorizing or the prioritizing the issues uh, time and again uh, and review and moving forward will be the best way, I think. Uh, thank you, Director BIF and AIDIA for inviting me to speak uh, and then share my uh, views with the uh, this, you know, August, uh, August uh, gathering. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Bhatt, for your remarks. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, China, you mentioned China. I think uh, China's involvement in uh, this region uh, has a tremendous uh, geopolitical impact and nobody can be uh, uh, 
impervious to the implications of uh, uh, China's involvement. So that's why I think uh, there is a, a huge interest in uh, uh, India, at least, uh, in how uh, the Nepal-China relationship is uh, uh, progressing. As you know, India has not uh, supported the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, and uh, for good reasons. One, because uh, it was uh, the road China-Pakistan economic corridor passes through Indian uh, territory, which means China was completely uh, insensitive to the Indian concerns about uh, India's uh, sovereignty. And second, uh, uh, the history of the BRI project itself. Uh, many of the countries uh, who benefit, who uh, what benefit from the BRI are today in major debt traps and uh, in the uh, to the extent that uh, they are leasing out uh, uh, their territories to China on long term leases etc so i think these are uh, very important concerns which uh, impact uh, other countries as well so there should be uh, no doubt engagement between india and nepal but we also should be discussing uh, the geopolitics uh, and uh, as uh, the earlier speaker said about the strategic geography uh, that is changing in the region. So thank you very much for uh, those remarks. And now I request uh, Shri Pushottam Oja to kindly uh, make his remarks. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, can you hear, hear me? You. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, Aida and Vivekananda Foundation for this very important uh, event. Uh, of course, uh, what I see that it is uh, timely organized in the sense that uh, uh, the it has been organized in the backdrop of the visit of uh, some high-level officials from India to Nepal. Of course, uh, two high-level dignitaries visited uh, during the past weeks, and now we are waiting the visit of Foreign Secretary. Of course, so what I see that it will um, have an impact of Tying on, uh, tying on the IC relation that uh, we are facing in the wake of the border dispute uh, between the uh, between our two countries. So, uh, previous speakers have uh, spoken a lot of about about many several about many issues, several issues. Uh, of course, on on the strategic issues and the diplomatic efforts that is going on, and uh, economic social and economic issues. Of course, it has been uh, particularly, I, I, I would like to highlight uh, on the economic issues, economic, particularly the economic areas, although it has been uh, sufficiently highlighted by our uh, former Minister of State, uh, as well as by Sanjay Ji, Sanjay Chadda, additional secretary, of uh, India, Ministry of Commerce, Department of uh, Commerce, India. Uh, so, without uh, repeating the same things, I will uh, try to delve on some key issues on, eco on economic field. Uh, first of all, it is uh, about the development cooperation. Of course, uh, uh, it has been said in the by some speakers, uh, by the press, by some previous speaker. Uh, some important uh, development projects that have been taken uh, under the bilateral cooperation, it has been inordinately delayed. So, for example, the ICP, Integrated Check Post, uh, memorandum for development of this check post was signed back in uh, 15, 15 years back in 2005. And uh, down the line, after 15 years, we are seeing the uh, foundation is still laying for Nepal and the ICP. And out of the four ICPs, in the, I mean the border check post, the Bhairava check post, when it is going to start, even we don't know. Um, however, the two ICP they are in operation in Birganj as well as in Virata. Well well so I think there are several projects, there are uh, some uh, 
uh, key projects that are still lying uh, in uh, there there are delays there are delays in implementation of these projects say for example panchishur they you are talking about panchishur uh, and uh, some other project even the upper karnali project and uh, even kathmandu raksho railway line there's uh, even gulaki road there are several projects that are uh, still uh, you see pending and it is delayed in implementation so i think so one of the area that we have to uh, look uh, is to expedite the implementation of the development cooperation project we signed the agreement but the implementation process is so slow that people lost uh, lost in interest on this project um, over the time so that is one of the area that we have to look at so with regard to other economic issues what i see that there are uh, complementarities uh, between nepal and india so i'll give you some figure about it say for example in terms of the investment uh, in terms of the investment or uh, investment of course in terms of the uh, export i mean the export export data uh, it is our um, i mean nepal's export uh, and import two third of the export and import um, goes to india or import is sourced from india export goes to india if you see the figure of last year uh, published by the department of customs of the government of nepal 71% of the total export goes to india only 29% goes in the rest of the world and in terms of the uh, in terms of the import we have the 61% uh, of import sourced from india and uh, remaining 39% is from rest of the world but the problem that they will they will lies in you see the unsustainable or the imbalance uh, greater imbalance on the trade of course if you see the trade figure over the last several years what we see that uh, the uh, import is 13 to 15 times higher than the export that means it is becoming very much unsustainable and there are reasons behind it of course the competitiveness one of one of the reason is competitiveness loss of competitiveness of the nepalese export and the impact of the uh, liberalization of trade elsewhere not only in nepal but elsewhere in in the uh, globe uh, say for example the uh, uh, unilateral preference that was being given to the least developed countries now uh, due to the decrease in the tariff level the competition has increased and those countries who were not very much competitive uh, were the losers so we are one of the losers loser country in terms of the export uh, competitiveness so i think this is something that we have to look at Although we have our 71% of the or two-third, more than two-third of our export to India, but the trade gap is even with it, India, it is too high. So if you see the figure, uh, this is the figure uh, published by the World Bank with data. Nepal is the tenth largest export destination of India. I mean, uh, in 2018, uh, in Nepalese import from India was Uh, 7 billion dollar while the import uh, while the export it is it is in terms of the export uh, if you compare the total uh, import of the india it is 0.07 percent that is negligible so that's why a sort of uh, you see complementarity is there in terms of the trade but the problem is uh, on balance maintaining the balance of trade um, maintaining the balance of balance between the export and import yeah, that is one of the area and in terms of the investment what i see that uh, uh couple of years ago india was the largest investor in nepal but it has been surpassed by china over the last 3 to 4 years so if you see the figure latest figure of uh, industries for fdi industries registered with the department of uh, industry of government of nepal 36% of total investment is from china and around 30% is Uh, from india now it, it, india has gone second after china uh, so uh, what i see that in terms of the tourism another aspect is tourism if you see the tourism uh, india is the largest source of tourists from nepal 
Uh, the latest figure, 2018 figure, shows that 17% uh, of the total uh, tourist arrival from um, arrival in Nepal was from India, and uh, uh, China was the second. US government, US was the USA was the third. So I think uh, the tourism is another area of economic cooperation, and of course, it, there are a lot of opportunities to increase uh, tourism. Somebody, someone uh, in the previous statement has said that there are uh, opportunities for enhancing uh, Buddhist circuit, and what I say that even the Hindu, uh, Hindu circuit can also be there. Eco tourism could be there. Adventure tourism could be there. So if we could work together, and if our uh, private sector entities could work together in order to enhance tourism and the combined tourism between the two countries, it will give benefit to both of, both of, both of our countries. So, Another area is, uh, it is linked with the international trade, of, of course, the transit. Transit is uh, 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 Minister of State Uday Rana, as uh, former Minister of State Uday Rana, has already said that 90% of the Nepalese uh, international overseas trade passes through the territory of India. We use the Port of India, Indian Railway Service and Road Services. And uh, lately, in 2009, um, uh, it has been agreed between the two government to use the inland waterways transport as a alternative additional transit mode of tra transit between uh, Nepal and India through the through India. So that is very much important uh, in order to um, uh, improve the transit operation and uh, reduce the cost of transaction. And at the same time, uh, uh, in on a pilot basis. The uh, electronic cargo tracking system has been introduced in order to move the cargo between the port in Kolkata, Haldia, or Vishakhapatnam, which Nepal is using presently, to reach the border in Nepal. So that is another development in transit. But there are a lot of potentialities and a lot of spaces for um, improvement in the transit, transit, uh, transit operation. Uh, the transit cost for Nepal is much, much higher. Uh, it is generally higher for all the landlocked uh, developing countries, but uh, it is higher. We are in the higher side of transaction in terms of the transit transaction cost, and there are a lot of uh, spaces to improve it. So for example, use of electronic means in transit documentation, transit procedures, uh, and uh, customs harmonization. Uh, there are many areas that, that we can improve. So, for example, um, the many international instruments are available for uh, simplification of the transit, simplification and harmonization of the transit procedure. It is the revised Kyoto Convention, uh, which Nepal and India both are members, and it is the TIR Convention. Of course, India has exited the TIR Convention um, just two years back, and we have the Vienna Program of Action. And we have the WTO trade facilitation agreement. These are very pertinent international instrument which we can uh, lay down, which we can follow to in, to reduce the transit transaction transaction cost. So for that purpose, we have to have the review and revision in the uh, provisions of the Treaty of Transit. That is very much important. At the same time, uh, we need to go for review and revision of the bilateral Treaty of Trade. Because the duty of trade, uh, what I see that uh, it has fallen back in uh, comparison to uh, SAFTA agreement, as well as in, as well as in comparison to free tariff preferences scheme that has, that has been uh, implemented by the government of India for all least developed countries. Uh, so I think the re review and the revision of this uh, Duty of trade and duty of transit should be looked on the perspective of this international instrument as well as the development, new development in the uh, trade and transit regime uh, in international trade. That, that is one of the areas that we have to uh, look at. So, uh, on the basis of this, what I see that uh, uh, five broad areas, I, I would like to suggest five broad areas of cooperation in improving the trade and transit uh, operations um, uh, between Nepal and India. One is the investment. Of course, I previously said that the investment, uh, uh, Indian investment is shrinking in Nepal. 
So I think we have to go on, you see, enhancing measures for improvement in the in the uh, 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 investment climate uh, within the within the country. That is, of course, uh, marketing of the Nepalese uh, marketing and roadshow of the Nepalese investment project in India. That is very much important. And uh, there might be need of uh, changing the rules and regulations and improving the environment. Uh, investment to environment within the country that is very much important and improve governance in increasing transparency rule based system reducing red tape and administrative and procedural uh, delays so these are very much important and uh, on top of that what i see that uh, the implementation one of the problem that we are facing that implementation honest implementation of the uh, rules regulation related to investment industry that is that is much uh, uh, another, another area that we have to improve at, at the domestic front. And then we need to bring in more investment from India. That is one area. And second, what I see that uh, we have to focus on development of trade infrastructure. Of course, when we talk about infrastructure, it may be inland container depot, I, ICP, inland, integrated custom checkpoints, special economic zone, and uh, of course, container freight station. There are development of the road, of improvement of the road, and provision of the electricity, reliable electricity, power facility. These are some areas that we have to look at. But the work is going in here, but the work um, development is very much slow. So I think we have to expedite uh, the process and improvement of the infrastructure, related infrastructure, border infrastructure. That is very much important in order to bring in more investment and in the development. Mm. Third, what I see that uh, uh, additional secretary of commerce has said that Sandhaji has said that uh, the, there is duty free uh, tariff preferences, tariff, duty free market access to Indian market for the Indian product. But what I see, there are a lot of non tariff barriers in export of Nepalese goods to India. So those non tariff barriers are especially. Uh, on sanitary and phytosanitary measures like the quarantine, food test, animal and plant quarantine, food test requirement, and there are some other hurdles like the tariff rate quota. So I think uh, both of the countries should work together in order to address these barriers. So for example, you see harmonization of standards, development of laboratories, and then uh, mutual recognition agreement. And once we have the mutual recognition agreement, we don't need to have two separate laboratories. One is Roxol and one in Delhi, because we can create common facilities in one place, and uh, that certification done by the uh, laboratory could be recognized uh, by the authorities in both countries. So I think there are several areas that we can address uh, those non tariff barriers. So uh, that is my third point. And fourth, it is about the simplification and uh, harmonization of document procedures and use of ICT. Uh, it is very much important. Um, particularly in the in the post pandemic scenario, the use of electronic means, electronic uh, certificate of origin or electronic declaration, or all these things. Electronically, we should go on um, aging our activities and aligning our activities on the electronic uh, basis. So that is that is very much important. And um, uh, the documents on of trade and the documents of transit. Uh, that is very much important. And of course, the harmonization of customs. You see, uh, we, we are still working on a very old fashion that there is need of a different set of documents for the Indian customs, different set of documents and procedures for Nepalese customs. Why don't we harmonize all these documents? So make it electronic so that the traders will have the opportunity to reduce the, this cost. So I think all these things, has to be translated in, into action through the review and revision of the Treaty of Trade and Treaty of Transit. That is very much the final point. Point. The fifth point is that we, we should go for uh, review and revision of the Treaty of Trade and Treaty of Transit. That is it, uh, in order to meet the emerging challenges. There are a lot of challenges in the in the, in the transaction, and what we see that uh, uh, the barriers on trade, barriers on transit. Uh, could be overcome uh, through adoption of the new technology uh, and also adoption of the uh, international uh, framework like the WTO framework, like the other uh, international convention framework. So I think uh, 
we have to uh, see on the applied. And uh, finally, what I see that when you talk about, uh, you see, this um, bringing economic prosperity and developing our economy, that is our interest. And maybe the, when you talk about uh, many issues, the interest of India lies in security. So I think we have to create a balance between the security interest of India and the developmental, meeting the development needs of Nepal. So I think if we could maintain a balance between that, I think we can uh, advance our economic co cooperation in a meaningful way. I will stop here and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Shotamji, for those uh, very uh, specific and very constructive uh, remarks. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, something that uh, is doable and uh, should be done. All the uh, suggestions you have made with respect to uh, simplification of uh, documentation, simplification of procedures, and you have suggested that uh, there should be a review and uh, a revision and review of uh, trade and uh, transit uh, treaties. And I think uh, Sanjay Chaddaji is uh, uh, listening to these, and I'm sure he has uh, taken note of. But uh, uh, working on these issues, uh, there is nothing political about it, and I think it should be done uh, for uh, mutual uh, benefit uh, and uh, uh, prosperity. Thank you so much for uh, those remarks. Now I turn to our uh, last speaker, Dr. Nihar from uh, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. I still not used to MP Nihar. Uh, the idea for me. Yeah, no problem, sir. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as a uh, last speaker, I'll be very, I'll try very brief because we need time to discuss, cover uh, question and uh, answer session. Uh, many thanks to BIF for the invitation and give me an opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, first of all, uh, as a Nepal uh, watcher, I would like to say one thing that uh, a couple of issues are flagged in this morning, like starting from Ambassador Rai. Uh, then General Sharma and the others, they all have, uh, gave emphasis on basically uh, shifting our focus from political issues to economic issues. I mean, this is not new also. I mean, when Dr. Gupta was heading IDSA, he was basically championing this issue. Basically, he gave a lot of emphasis on basically shifting uh, our lessons, Indian Nepal lessons from political issues to economic issues. And he undertook a visit to Nepal in 2010 in this regard also. Uh, I mean, uh, as I'm watching this development uh, for the last uh, 10 years since then, I don't see much progress in this regard also, like shifting from political issues to like segregate the political issues from the economic issues. Uh, currently also, I mean, if you see the political issue as a structure, the economic issues, cultural issues, people to people relationship, military issues, these are the substructures. So when my argument is here, when the political connectivity, the political structure is affected, obviously it will affect the other substructures. So my emphasis would be here because particularly this applies in case of Nepal in relations, I can talk about other uh, country relations because the political issue or the political leaders have been taken a major role and major role in the particularly shaping and uh, basically this relationship. I mean, when the, during the major political transitions in the Nepal also, the political leaders of India have played a major role in that, starting from Jawaharlal Nehru, um, Chandrasekhar ji and others, they all have taken a major role in that. So I don't see any, you know, like segregating political issues and moving out of economic issues. It is not at all, I think, not possible. I think it's that both the relationship, both the, both the issues have to go uh, to, together at this moment. Uh, coming to this, uh, 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 I'll just focus on a little bit about this India's infrastructure uh, investment and particularly connectivity investment uh, in Nepal. Um, uh, Mr. Chha emphasized on that basically and others also discussed about that a uh, lot of projects, uh, Indian funded projects are going slow or running uh, slow. Uh, I think uh, currently uh, since this uh, BJP government came to power, I think under this uh, the policy of uh, never, 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 never uh, first policy and uh, that uh, India's vision for the world that is a uh, sabka saath sabka bikas. 
I think uh, around 15 projects are uh, continuously active uh, with uh, Nepal. And almost all projects are doing very well, except two projects they are basically running late. One is that Jogbani uh, Birat Nagar railway link that is delayed because of the mostly um, uh, basically uh, land acquisition issues. And second is that Holaki Mark. And that is again because of the land acquisition, or perhaps also more I can say because of the political willpower is missing from the Nepali side. So almost like this uh, operationalization of Roxal, Amalek Ganj, uh, Transboundary Oil Pipeline, that was uh, completed even the, before the uh, deadline. And Government of India are now currently modeling to have another uh, oil pipeline uh, with Nepal from the western side. Perhaps the Foreign Secretary will be visiting and discussing on that issue. Uh, Kakad Vita, uh, Pani Tanki and Fulvari, that uh, feeder roads, I think their construction is going very well. Uh, and this month, actually, our uh, Commerce Minister inaugurated that ICP uh, Nepal Guns. So the construction has been started and Bhairwa plan is uh, still going on. Uh, that uh, proposal, I mean, construction plan is still uh, going on. So most of the, uh, uh, I mean, projects except two, I think, on track. And I say that any project in Nepal is not uh, running slow or it is being delayed, perhaps mostly because of the internal political situation of Nepal, number one. Second is the list of around 15 land related act starting from 1950s to, I mean, before that till this 2015 constitution, so much confusion is there, how to deal with that land acquisition issue from the Nepal, uh, Nepal side. Um, and, uh, and the most importantly, I would like to I, I'll share here that uh, another factor could be like from the government of India side, since this is a very important the foreign secretary is visiting, Government of India said one thing is missing that lack of exports and technical capability in the land issues in a particularly in our ME. Uh, that needs to be enhanced uh, because that will bring a lot of clarity, particularly implementing projects in our neighborhood, particularly not only in Nepal, in the neighborhood also. Then government of India may also um, emphasis on basically to have a strengthen its uh, uh, basically improve its rehabilitation and uh, compensation package because that will again facilitate and expedite our projects because it is also affecting because of because we can learn these lessons from maybe ADB, maybe from World Bank, maybe from AIB because all these funded, these in multilateral institution funds are not being delayed in case of Nepal because they are giving a lot of emphasis on rehabilitation and compensation uh, packages. And the, another thing Government of India may consider about that not giving much emphasis on that basically low, lowest bidding um, that uh, project uh, um, that, uh, that company should give in that project. So because first give, it's emphasis should be given about the technical capabilities and uh, uh, resource capability of that particular uh, that uh, company so which can handle that project that they should give. And the fourth thing could be like the inter-ministerial coordination, particularly in Indian case, it has been said that there is a lack of coordination between ME, Minister of Commerce, Minister of MH and other uh, auxiliary agencies. So that needs to be expedited. And lastly, I can say that Nepal particularly, uh, 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 Ambassador Ranjit Rai emphasized on that, there is a tremendous dilemma and confusion in the internal politics in about basically three connectivity projects offers are coming to them. One is the under BRI, nine projects of her has come from china side under mcc that is 500 million challenge corporation is there project is there and at the same time government of india since 2014 has offered so many um, multiple project multiple connectivity projects like bbin asian highway uh, that um, Myanmar and that uh, that side the other other east east, east east asia highway so so many projects are simultaneously has come and nepalese are almost in confused confusion how to deal and how to tackle this kind of you know, all these uh, offers. I can suggest, I can end my uh, talk by giving suggestions to Nepal that looks the BBI is the most low hanging fruit uh, for uh, Nepal because it gives basically multiple offers, uh, basically it gives a multilateral platforms because this is a, um, basically, basically they don't have to deal with Nepal, uh, so India bilaterally, wide ranging options to access seaports starting from Kolkata, Pisa, Patnam to uh, Southeast Asia, single transit trade framework, then faster and seamless cargo movement under the BBIN framework and zero investment. They don't have to do anything because already the infrastructure is already, already there and only the modalities has to be finalized. And if Nepal cooperates and Nepal takes interest, I think that will be win in future for Nepal and India uh, in future. I'll stop here, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, uh, Nihad, for uh, those uh, brief but very pointed uh, remarks. And I think the point you made uh, is uh, extremely relevant.
and this is something that I also wanted to say at some point of time that sometimes delays are not only India's fault. And I think Nepal also has to look at its own uh, procedures and uh, its own regulations. And more important, uh, this uh, uh, sometimes uh, the opposition for the sake of op opposition. So the, the politics and economics do get uh, linked uh, in that sense. But uh, I think Nepal also can uh, probably review some of its own procedures and see how these projects can be fast tracked. So now uh, we come to the, we are a little bit late, uh, but maybe uh, if uh, you all agree, because this has been an important uh, uh, round table, we can spend some time uh, in uh, discussion. Uh, so the floor is now open and if uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, uh, we can take some time for discussing some of these issues. The floor is open. So let's be brief and uh, you can make your comments. Yes, sir. Ambassador Chandra. Thank you very much. Am I audible? I'll yes, we can hear you. Brief. First, uh, I wanted to thank you for organizing this roundtable. As you say, it's extremely important. And we are perhaps on the cusp of a situation where our relationship will look upwards now. Uh, Nepal is a very important neighbor, and hence we attack. Uh, a great importance to an improved relationship with it. Uh, I wanted to underline the fact, and this idea has been expressed that economic ties are very important and we must uh, nurture them. I share that thought, but I wanted to leave a word of caution here. And that is that relationships work in totality. They can't be dealing from political linkages and ties. And should the political situation deteriorate, the economic ties will not improve. It's not possible. The two go hand in hand. And I think that point needs to be looked at. Uh, I think we have a great advantage because we have multifaceted traditional ties. And this is a factor of strength which can be used to overcome the differences and improve linkages. Uh, I agree with the thought that was expressed by one of the speakers that this trust has been there and we need to look at, look at it. And looking at it from the Indian viewpoint, I think a lot, many in India are disturbed by the constant India bashing that takes place in Nepal. And I think something needs to be done about it. Uh, remember, this is not being done in India. There's no Nepal bashing in India, ever. This doesn't happen. But on the other side, this is constantly happening and this does create problems. Also, I think the China factor does need to be taken into account. Uh, many feel that the uh, Kalapani issue was raised to the level it was that at Chinese product. And what is being perceived in India amongst many in this country is that there is a definite Nepal tilt towards China. This is something which I think Nepal needs to be a little more sensitive about. Uh, also take the Kalapani issue itself. Fine, there are differences between neighbors. And those differences need to be resolved through discussion, not through constitutional amendments. This also is a problem. I was just mentioning these, that these are some of the issues from an Indian viewpoint, which I think Nepal needs to look at. Uh, I do agree completely with the thought, and in fact, I have written about it as well, that when there are differences between neighbors, it is essential, it is imperative to resolve them at the earliest. And in this, in some cases, I do admit that we have perhaps been slow on this, even on the border dispute and differences. So this is something which needs to be looked at. And finally, the last thought I want to leave with you 
is you know the EPG report. It is essentially recommendatory in nature. It is really for both governments to derive the best out of it and develop a program of action to improve relations. And uh, I, for one, and the Indian government, for one another, is open to a revision of the 1960 agreement. It, it is there is a mechanism in place. That mechanism should be used. It must be used. And a new treaty based on uh, strict reciprocity needs to be developed. Thank you very much. Uh, Arvindji, aapka wo, unmute yourself, I think. Unmute. Sorry, sorry. I request uh, Shriyala Dhatta to make uh, come in uh, uh, briefly with her remarks, and then I'll uh, go to, I think, Pushottam Ojaji and uh, Jana Katwal uh, want to make uh, some comments. Yeah. Um, very quickly, sir, I think in all my uh, last few years of dialogue with uh, Nepal, this is probably one of the best ones that I've you know, uh, heard today. Because in terms of bringing the depth on both sides, I mean, the kind of issues that have been flagged, obviously, you know, they're thinking people on both sides who understand the issues. But the point that I think both Nihar and Ambassador Chandra made, that despite understanding what are the impediments, what are the problems, we've always seen that ne Nepal loves to hate India. And India loves to believe that Nepal is up to no good. I mean, you know, this core misunderstanding that we have, and, you know, despite whatever global changing order and everything, all and Indians' global, admit, uh, you know, ambitions uh, being realized, and Nepal, you know, having a larger outreach, the point is that the intrinsic relation between India and Nepal will never change for geographical reasons. And, you know, if you are always going to have a political constituency in Nepal who's constantly going to, you know, bash up this, and there's obviously political dividends in that story. And because of that, India has this constant reactionary approach to it also. I mean, you know, whether it's the border closure or other things, it's never been initiated from India's point. It's always been a reaction to something that Nepal has done. And I think, I mean, you know, all these development projects will take place. Uh, other economic business opportunities will take place, you know, tourism, all that. But the point is the larger picture. I mean, do we understand how important we are to each other? And I think, you know, we've understood in the years that uh, no matter what we do, uh, you know, the core constituency remains. And despite, you know, China coming into Nepal, other larger players in Nepal, what India can do for Nepal and how important Nepal is to India, once we have that, if we stop playing this, you know, political narrative constantly, which Nepal does, I'm not talking about that. In India, and in, in fact, political leaders, I don't recall in the last two decades, there's been ever any anti-Nepal sentiments. Uh, there has been an official reaction to some of the acts and measures that Nepal has undertaken. But even today, as we speak, we have seen that Nepal has this very strong constituency that loves to whip up this anti-India rhetoric. And once you know, we are able to address that. And what is the problem? And if you can, you know, I think out of this, if you can ask Sunil that, you know, why don't we look at something that what can be done in the next five years? What can be done in the next 10 years? Between bilateral, you know, states between who are so close, I'm sure a lot of issues are there, but it's possible to address it. You know, tariff barriers and things like that. But I'm saying the larger question has to be addressed. And I think people of Nepal only can address that. That what is the dividend that they get by whipping anti India? I mean, I, I've never understood okay. that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Oja Ji, Purushottam, Mr. Purushottam Oja. Unmute. Unmute. Okay. Uh, just a uh, quick uh, clarification in respect of the delays in the Nihar Naik talked about BBI and NAC and highway. Uh, BBI and motor vehicle agreement was signed in uh, June 15, 2015. It has already crossed five, five, five years, but still it is not in the implementable stage. Uh, pending the formation of the protocol, it is there. It's, even we don't know when it is going to be operationalized. That is one part. And uh, what I see that gap between plan and implementation is a uh, is a feature in this part of the world because we plan a lot and we we make a very beautiful plan, but when you go for implementation, then there is some problem. So I think BBIN is also hanging on that very uh, balance. So what I see that 
even if we prepare the protocols for VVI and motor vehicle agreement, we have to go on making comprehensive plan for operationalizing the uh, protocol route. Maybe different route may be identified in the protocol. And these uh, routes, maybe there might be lack of bridges, lack of, of course, uh, um, the, uh, roads and missing links. There might be different uh, problems on that. And even the intermodal linkages problem would also be there. So I think we have to go on, uh, first of all, uh, preparing the uh, protocol. Uh, finalizing the protocol, signing yeah. it, and making it operational, and bringing a comprehensive plan for um, sub-regional cooperation, sub-regional sub connectivity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Katwal. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Sir, thank you so much, both organizers, for organizing this dialogue, which is very, very important between these two countries. So as I see it, the fate of uh, Nepal and India uh, has been uh, inextricably uh, linked up uh, throughout their history. And I believe uh, will remain so for the centuries to come, sometimes rising and sometimes falling. But as a Nepalese, I take pride in being a Nepalese citizen. And I, as a Nepalese citizen, would never ever even think of uh, being an anti-Indian. Uh, uh, it is not in my genes. It is not in my blood. And no Nepalese, a true Nepalese, would ever think of, uh, you know, uh, uh, going against the Indian interest. That is my belief, and that's what it should be. Now, but what is happening at time is the Nepal's pure psychosis, India's vastness the landlocked nature of Nepal, the excessive dependence on, on India, and the uh, Nepalese aspiration to become an a, a active member of the international community against the Indian uh, uh, actual or, or imagined uh, uh, security uh, interest uh, has been occasionally causing these irritants and, uh, uh, and, and, and distrust. And that needs to be solved at the highest political level uh, because Nepal and India just cannot remain without talking and negotiating, as I've said it earlier. And this dialogue would, uh, I hope, would bring uh, that, that level of, uh, you know, uh, uh, removing this distrust and trust deficit. And then would you all be recommending this to the highest level, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, deciding, uh, uh, resolving this uh, territorial uh, uh, dispute that we have, uh, which is uh, uh, a very uh, sensitive issue uh, because of the importance that it is uh, getting it right now uh, uh, in the in the whole of the uh, region uh, and the uh, things like you know EPG, all that thing needs to be uh, resolved uh, at the highest level, and I hope uh, you'd all recommend it. And uh, Nepal and India uh, must travel together because there is no other alternative for both of these countries because the importance of each other is realized and understood and it must be, you know, uh, remain like that uh, throughout our history. Thank you so much. I'm gr very grateful to you all, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks, General Katwal. Maybe we can take one or two more comments. And then we'll close it. Would anybody like to? Uh, General Ravi Sani, I think you wanted to make a comment. Sorry. I think uh, it has been one of the finest dialogues we have got because you see, the differences can only be solved in case we are frank and candid and still be well meaning. I thought it was a very well conducted dialogue because both sides have been very frank, but also were very reasonable. I think the points which have come up would be shared with the governments, both the government, I think, should be shared with the, both, both the governments and should be resolved at the earliest because the relationship between the two countries is extremely important. But I like to re-emphasize what Ambassador Sti Chandra has said. There has never been a Nepal bashing as far as India is concerned. 
but we are quite sensitive to this relationship. And I do hope this is reciprocated by the DAPLI also, because together we can pull. The relationship, of course, has to have a political content, but more economy should be injected into it. Because I think both of us are developing countries and we can help each other. The small irritants which was brought out can be smoothened as early as possible. Because let's not forget, I mean, despite having advanced, despite having modernized, there is a civilizational sort of a link, which is very much there, we just can't be ignored. And we have built our relationship on that. And of course, there will be irritants. But the irritants should not be taken to that level where they become almost impossible to solve. And the Nepalese also have to be slightly more sensitive to uh, our, what do you call, security concern, and especially what is happening on the Indochina border also. So in, th in these times, we are supposed to be a little more sensitive to each other. Not that we are saying that you should have relationship with both the independent countries, both have sovereign rights to have relationship with anybody they want to, but they must keep into view the concerns of each other's, uh, what do you call, threat perspective. And of course, we should be also making sure that we come to each other's uh, uh, assistance, help, so that we can develop together. But thank you so much. I think it was wonderful that we had a very, very candid and very reasonable sort of a agenda, and everybody contributed magnificently to that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dana Sani. One question which uh, Ambassador Satish Chandra had also touched upon, and maybe uh, if there could be some response to that, that Nepal having uh, passed a constitutional amendment on the uh, territorial issue, uh, what kind of a negotiations can be held? You have know, preempted any negotiations by this act. So it becomes a very sensitive issue, no doubt. But then uh, what is the way? Because you have already uh, declared your uh, uh, intentions by uh, passing a constitutional amendment. So anybody from the Nepalese side like to react to this? OK, so let's leave it to the uh, Foreign Secretary. I think. Uh, as Foreign Secretary goes now to uh, uh, Nepal, the entire burden of improving India-Nepal relationship is now in his uh, on on him, and he has to resolve it in a, maybe one or two days. So <laughs> good luck to him. But certainly we will convey some of these uh, issues and concerns uh, which we have heard, and some suggestions uh, which have come out uh, to them, and uh, they can do what they have to do with them. But I think uh, this discussion brought out uh, quite clearly one that uh, uh, this is uh, a good chance now to start uh, repairing the relationship which has been damaged in the last uh, few uh, years. And perhaps uh, as uh, one of the Nepalese speakers said that we must go beyond the chest thumping uh, nationalism and look at these uh, issues in a pragmatic and uh, rational fashion not uh, ignoring the political side or the big picture, which of course uh, remains uh, very important. But even then, as uh, I think every speaker uh, pointed out, there is a huge amount uh, of work that can be done and uh, which impacts uh, the ordinary people uh, uh, on uh, both sides. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think uh, uh, the Nepalese uh, friends uh, should uh, uh, realize that uh, uh, China is uh, today a very important uh, uh, factor for us. And uh, India-China relationship is, uh, is also uh, quite stressed at this uh, moment. We have a major, huge uh, territorial uh, uh, issue, a standoff uh, on the borders. And uh, that apart, I think the whole uh, geopolitics of China, the BRI, uh, it's uh, inroads into uh, India's uh, very sensitive neighborhood, uh, modernization of its uh, uh, Navy, um, uh, armed forces, or PLA, and uh, what they are doing in uh, the Indo-Pacific, particularly in South China Sea, East China Sea, 
what they are doing in uh, Xinjiang, in China, Pakistan, in Pakistan. I think all these are, uh, uh, are creating a lot of uh, discomfort, and not only in India, but across the world. A recent uh, Pew uh, uh, survey uh, or opinion survey showed that uh, China's image all across the world, and I think there are some number of countries, has gone down quite tremendously. China's soft power or China's, uh, you know, the BRI and the way it has actually entrapped so many nations into net traps uh, is not going down well. And uh, I think China has used this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis to become even more assertive. And uh, the, uh, of course, uh, there are other countries involved. U.S.-China relationship is very important. Even ASEAN, in ASEAN, uh, China has been able to drive a wedge. So uh, when the Indians look at uh, India-Nepal relationships, China does emerge as an important factor. We may or may not uh, entirely agree on uh, perceptions, as somebody said, it's a game of perceptions. But I think it is necessary to talk about this, particularly in the seminars uh, like uh, this. And that is why at a time when India and uh, India was facing a Chinese uh, aggression on its borders, and suddenly this uh, Kalapani issue, the redrawing of the maps, the constitutional amendment, etc., all this came up. So this created uh, uh, some discomfort. But as uh, uh, the speaker said, this does not necessarily create an anti-Nepal feeling. It's only it's a political question and should be resolved through political means. And uh, the uh, visits, I think, which are starting now, will hopefully contribute to a further improvement of relationships and address what uh, General Katwal talked about, that is the uh, distrust, distrust that is there between the two countries. And this dialogue, I'm sure, which has been held in a very uh, civilized fashion and uh, in a very frank and uh, uh, open fashion, and yet uh, it, is, uh, it was uh, uh, motivated by the genuine feeling of uh, improving India-Nepal relationships. Uh, given our long uh, cultural connect, history, connect, geography, and so on. So I want to thank uh, everyone uh, uh, for joining us today, and particularly our uh, uh, guests from Nepal, uh, who gave us uh, their uh, very uh, constructive views, candid views. Uh, I outlined the problems, and I do hope that uh, they would also uh, take back uh, some of the concerns, which is really, uh, on some occasions, we find that perhaps uh, this uh, the requisite sensitivity to Indian concerns, which is also important, uh, should also be shown. And while in these dialogues, we find our dialogues are quite uh, uh, civilized and friendly, but when we look at uh, the Nepalese uh, media, uh, there we don't find uh, this feeling. And uh, Nepalese media, I think, is uh, becoming, uh, there are a lot of anti-India feelings which are expressed. I hope that uh, Sunil Casey and his uh, uh, institute and the vast uh, strategic community that now takes part in his activities would play uh, a role in uh, in uh, uh, in, uh, in educating the Nepalese media. Particularly, some of it can at time be very very offensive and uh, uh, anti-India uh, because that is the purpose of our uh, dialogue also to generate uh, good feelings about each other in our, uh, amongst our people. So I want to again uh, thank uh, uh, Sunil Casey and uh, the Nepalese guests for uh, uh, having spared their time for this uh, dialogue. And also uh, Ambassador uh, Ranjit Ray and uh, Sanjay Chadda, Nihar and uh, Rakesh Sharmaji and uh, others who have participated in this. Thank you very much. Oscar. Oscar, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.